Hello, and welcome to Talking Volumes. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm the Director of Programming for NPR News, Stephanie Curtis. Uh, we have a great season for you. We've got William Kent Kruger still coming, Amor Tolls, and of course tonight, uh, the incomparable Kate DiCamillo and her imagination. We're gonna have so much fun. We've been having such a good time down in the green room. I can't wait for you guys to have Carrie and Kate out here talking. Anyway, we could not have a season like this without our season sponsors, Bremer Bank, and Becker Furniture World, so I'd like to thank them. I want to thank everyone who's a Star Tribune subscriber and an NPR, new NPR member. Uh, you also helped make this possible, so thank you. I'd like to bring out Lori Herzl now to tell us a little bit about the Star Tribune book section. Hi, Lori. Hi, how are you? Nice Good. to so see you. What do you have coming up? Oh, gosh. Hi, everybody. It's <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen a group of people this big in a long time. This is wonderful. Um, I hope you all have programs, because you probably know I interviewed Kate DiCamillo a couple weeks ago, and it ran in the Strib, but it's also been reprinted in your program. Mm -hmm. uh, this Sunday, coming up in the Star Tribune, I interviewed our new poet laureate, Gwen Westerman. Cool. So you'll see a Q&A with her. Um, I've interviewed William Kent Kruger, so we'll have a story, um, a profile of him coming up as well. And um, as you know, Louise Erdrich has a new book coming out, so we're working on that. So it's been a great fall for writers, a great fall for Minnesota writers. If you want to send me an email and tell me what you guys are reading, I'll put that in the Sunday paper. Just send it to books at startribune.com. Thanks, Thanks, Lori. Thank you. All right, without further ado, let's bring out the host of Talking Volumes, Carrie Miller. Welcome, everyone. Nice to have the brave, the mighty, and the masked with us. Do you feel kind of brave? So I'm now to the age where I do need reading glasses, reading glasses, and I can never tell when I really need them and when I don't. So I'll probably sit on them. If you were here a couple of weeks ago when we all opened Talking Volumes with Lauren Groff, was anybody, yes, thank you. Thank you for supporting the season like that. You know that we spent much of the evening in the wonders of medieval Europe with a poet nun who ran the Abbey like Jeff Bezos runs Amazon. I mean, that's what I got out of that conversation. <laughs> Tonight, we are back in medieval Europe and back in a monastery with the good brothers of the Order of the Chronicles of Sorrowing. Say that three times fast. Did anybody catch that? What I just said, there'll be more conversation about that. And I started thinking about this. Maybe there is something about a worldwide plague that puts writers in the, in the mind of medieval Europe? I don't know. Kate DiCamillo's new book asks, what happens when you create a special circle of a demon goat, a brilliant girl meant for great things and a brave but impulsive boy, and then you send them on a quest for truth and goodness? Kate DiCamillo is a two-time Newbery Award-winning author, and she is a hometown girl. Her new book is titled The Beatrice Prophecy. Please welcome her to her first ever appearance at Talking Volumes. It's so exciting to be here. Where have you been all my life? Where, this, where have you been all my this life? This is weird. I've been here, you've been this here. This is weird that you this haven't done. This is the first done... time we've, ever, we've ever met. I mean, you might change your mind by the time this is over with. You might think <laughs> that never needs to happen She's again. She's been downstairs yeah, yeah. trying to get the well, questions out of me relentlessly. She accused like... me. <laughs> she accused me, because she went to the bathroom, of looking through her purse, which I did not do. <laughs> I said, did you notice I took my script and my questions with me when I left the room? She's like, how dare you? you I, think just, I, would... I just know that you're formidable. <laughs> I, I listen to the radio, so I, I'm, I'm ready. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so glad to have you here. I, it's I, really I'm so great. glad to be here. And I'm so, it's, let's. I know. Y'all. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for coming. 
it, it's um, reading is uh, e even when it's just one person in a book is still communal, and that's why things like this matter so much because it delivers that all the way home. There's something really, really special about a group of people getting together around a book. I know. So it, it's, I know. boy, have I missed it. Even though I never want to step out onto stage. It's just like, yeah, no, I'd prefer not to. You know Bartleby, the Scrivener? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's me. But here I am, and I'm so <laughs> glad to be here. Yeah. So what a way to start. Yeah. Right. I wish I wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's the stepping out. It's the stepping out onto right. the stage. It's terrifying. Yeah. I get the feeling from uh, reading back through <clears throat> your many books and then reading this book that you have an interest in the chemistry of unexpected friends. Like, what happens when you throw some people together and they develop a kind of commonality and chemistry? And there's a, there's a thread that uh, goes back through some of your other work with this. So, sure, yeah. Okay, so I'm curious about what interests you about what, that. What interests me about that? Well, you know, I, I've said this a lot, and you probably in doing your research have come across me saying this, because ah. I know you've done your research, um, because I looked at your notes. Um, <laughs> I um, knew it. That I, I, I don't know what... I'm doing, I do, I write behind my own back. So I'm not even looking at some, I don't think, oh, this interests me, this theme. Okay. I, there's, um, uh, when, uh, but my very first book was published um, because of Winn-Dixie. And I, I. Name dropper. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, uh, I was working at a bookstore at the time, and you know, let's, I mean, this is a long time ago, and um, you could do school visits where they paid you to come into the school and talk about the book wow. that you had written. Really? Yes. Wow. It was just like amazing to me. So I got signed up to do the very first one of those. And I was just like thrilled because I was going to make in one school visit what I made in a week at the bookstore. <laughs> and it was like, oh boy. <laughs> and so I go into a fifth grade classroom and I stand up in front of the class with the teacher and she says to these kids, um, here's the person who wrote the book. And now what we're going to do is talk about the themes in the book. And um, I felt a bead of sweat move down um, <laughs> this. I, it's like, I'm not going to get this $250 um, <laughs> because I don't know. It was know. about the money. I don't know <laughs> what the themes are in the book. I have <laughs> zero idea. And, there, and, and, and so <laughs> mercifully, this wonderful teacher <laughs> and these fifth graders, they work together. To, to put the themes up on, on the board. And I'm like, oh, that seems right. Is this that's, all that's, really true? It is true. And then when I got out to my car, I wrote down the themes <laughs> so that I, like, the next school visit, I'm like, let's talk about the themes that are in this, this book. But I mean, but it, all of which is to say, yes, I, I can see after the fact that I am interested in unexpected alliances right. and people who that you, you would, uh, that has been there from the very beginning. Yes. Um, and when those fifth graders told me the themes of Because of when dixie mm -hmm. friendship was the first thing that came up there. Right. And, and it's friendship between Opal and uh, somebody who's been in jail uh, for, you know, so it's just, those are, it, it happens again and again and again. There's a monk and a girl and a goat. A and demon goat. A demon goat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. An unexpected alliance. An unexpected alliance. We'll get alliance. to that in a minute. Okay. But I, I, were you somebody who, as a kid, made friends easily? I, I've always thought that was my uh, one true skill, was really? to be able to make friends. Yeah. So, you know, when I think of a skill, I think of it as something that one develops. Okay. Um, was it a... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> was it a, I thought you were going to say superpower oh, or something. Oh, it, it, what, you mean, was I a calculating child yes. who went around trying That's to working people over? No, I just, I feel like... Um, <laughs> working people over. <laughs> I, I feel like I just, it, you know, I came from, this is, you know, I, I came from a single parent home and... Um, and I found my way in the world because of all the people who opened their doors to me. Um, and I, I grew up in a small town in central Florida, and uh, I was back there in 2016 for Ramey Nightingale at the library uh, of, in the town where I grew up. And it, this whole thing was delivered to me as everybody came through the line, all these people that I'd known when I was a kid, that the town raised me wow. um, and and so and that I'm just so aware of how people opened their hearts and their doors to me and fed me I'm really fond of being fed um, <laughs> so yeah so this is something that came kind of naturally to maybe you maybe there was just a desperation in me that people responded to I but don't yeah I, okay so but I think kids see desperation as somewhat off-putting. Off and they're very good at detecting it. There was something else that... Uh, I, I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Is that it? Well, you know, I th it's funny because I think back to, um, you know, how remember back in the day when you were choosing sides for uh, any kind of sport? Yes. You know? Terrifying. I, I, I'm like a handicap for any kind of, you know, like, and, and so I was, but I was never the last person standing there because I could keep everybody entertained while I was um, helping them lose the game, you know? <laughs> so I, I, I guess, I guess that I did work at some, which is what she's trying to get out of me. You had to really, really do a song and dance <laughs> to make people be your friend. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, that humor is also kind of a defense mechanism <laughs> in a kid, right? It sure is, yes. Say more. <laughs> um, well, no, it, it definitely is. It, and it's, um, it's, it's a way of putting up your guard and also letting your guard down at the same time. It's both right. things. It welcomes people in, but it also... Um, it protects you too. Yeah. Are are we having a, a therapy session? Yeah. Okay. Remember downstairs when you said, "What is this like?" And I said, "Oh, we'll just talk about your." As she shuffled her notes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how much did the how how much did your friends and the people in your community know about your father having left? The fact that. You know, you were, it was your mother and you and your brother, right? Right. I mean, was that something that you felt like you had to cover up in some ways or you were compensating for that or? Um, I, you know, it was a different time um, and, and it was a small town and uh, there was nobody else who uh, came from a single parent uh home and among my friends really? and also nobody who was divorced. So yeah, I felt it keenly, but, um, I also, I remember, I mean, it, it, you couldn't hide it. He wasn't there. Right. Um, and, uh, I remember, uh, for a while because it was, there was always this illusion that he was going to come back. It was an illusion that he fed us and that, um, and that my mother believed in for a while. And I remember saying to Ida Bell Collins, who was the neighbor at the top of the street who knew everything that was going on, she said, oh, when is your father coming? And I said, soon. And I, I remember thinking, not true at all. I know what's going on, and he's not coming back, which is when I you know, thought, if I had long blonde hair, I bet you I could get him to come back. And so then I entered into a battle with my mother to grow my hair long. She's like, you look stupid with your hair long. Um, your, your face is too small. And, and then it was always just her trying to like, you know, we weren't good at styling hair in my family. So that was a <laughs> lot of, yeah. <laughs> One of those superpowers you did, yeah, that, not, yeah, yeah, did not get. Yeah. It's so interesting though, to hear you say, you knew even as you were. Kids always know. Fibbing. Yeah, kids know. 
that it was it, a fib. It's, it, it, let me let me lead you into this this very thing that um, I, I get it, it, I get this question a lot. Um, why is why do so many bad things happen in your books? Um, oh, people ask you that. Yeah, because you know they're books for kids, and it's just kids are the ones that you know kids when they. Um, pretend like their father is coming back. They're doing it for the adults. Mm -hmm. Kids know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yes, go you, ahead. You Carrie. said a, a minute ago that <laughs> it was an illusion with, I mean, that your mother even bought into this yeah. illusion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, we, we moved from Philadelphia to, again, it feels very much like a, Therapy session, but um, we we Good. we moved from Philadelphia to Central Florida ostensibly because of me, and I, I kept on getting pneumonia, and it was uh, I, I'm so old that geographical cures were still prescribed, <laughs> and um, so uh, we went to Florida, and my father was an orthodontist, and he's like I'm gonna stay up here and I'll sell the practice, and then I'll join you down there. That was the that was the illusion. And do you know why he didn't? No, but I know that uh, and I'm sitting on this stage is part of, you know, that, that I'm a writer is always an attempt to try and answer that question. It, it has come up when you've been talking to kids, hasn't it? Sure, yeah. Kids, and, and you know, I, it's part of when I, you know, I had a PowerPoint um, because after a while they told me I had to have a PowerPoint, so I had one. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, I'm, again, it's that thing where I'm not going to stand up there and tell them um, that this thing didn't happen. Right. I'm just going to, and, and kids, uh, sometimes it was electrifying with them. They would get it. They would put it together themselves. Because I would, I would talk about how sick I, I was. Sick a lot as a kid. Are you going to make notes about that? Uh huh. Um, and and I would sick I, as a child. <laughs> Next session. <laughs> I would, I would, I would tell them about all the different diseases I ha had, and none of which they even know anymore. It's like I had chickenpox and dead silence, and and I had measles three times. They don't even know what measles are anymore. So, but and they, you could feel them putting it together of like, wait a minute, this is where the stories come from, um, wow. because and, and they and they would say that to me afterwards, and they would want to talk to you about their missing parents afterwards. It's like that's one of the things that I really miss is that chance to do a one-on-one -on -one with a kid that needs to be seen that way, and for me to tell them, you'll be fine. Um, I, I read an exchange that you had with Matt De La Pena in Time Magazine, who I've interviewed a few times. Isn't he a delight? He is something. Yeah, yeah he's, he's wonderful. Um, and he asked you a question about how honest a writer can be to kids about the hard things of life, to what you were saying a little earlier. And you told this incredibly poignant story of being in South Dakota in this auditorium full oh, of kids. Oh, is that what I did? I was like, I wonder what I said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and even when we were just talking about that, I flashed on that that. I flashed on that little boy's would, face. Would you, would you talk about that? Um, it was in South Dakota. It was 900 kids in an auditorium. And, um, and it doesn't happen all the time, that, but you could feel like these kids, 900 of them, like they were so present and they got it. And, um, and they got this thing about like these, these things that seem bad actually give you something. And also, I'm standing up here and talking to you about these bad things that happened and telling you that you can be okay. And um, so uh, it was just a, a fabulous group of kids. And I stood um, and uh, at the end of the show and like just talked to them as they exited. They had to get on school buses. And one little boy grabbed my hand. I can't do it. You can. <laughs> um, and said, I'm here, and uh, my, my father is in uh, California, and I, didn't, I don't know if I'm ever going to see him ag again, but you said that you're okay, so I know I'm going to be okay. And that, that 
That's what a book can do, though. That's, let, let me get back on so track, because you're very pleased with yourself, <laughs> because, and I don't like that, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> who's got this? She did it to me. She oh did it gosh. to me. She's got the upper hand. You're the first person who's ever <laughs> nailed me on that. Yes. <laughs> no, but, don't get back on track too fast. But, but you know, it, it's funny because um, th this is another moment I think that I can talk about without crying. Um, but I, I'm uh, friends with... Uh, somebody who sat on the stage, Ann Patchett. Mm -hmm. And um, I was at her bookstore not that long ago, and she wanted me to talk to one of her booksellers who had read Despero when he was a kid. And uh, he was the most lovely human being. And he told me that that book saved his life. And then he went on to say, and I'm standing here getting to say this to you now, but I can guarantee you that there are kids all over the world who have read that book and felt seen, and it saved their lives. And so it doesn't matter whether or not we get to say it. It's happening. And that is the miracle of books. So am I back on track now? Yeah. <laughs> nicely done. Yeah, yeah. Very I nicely done. I mean, because done. that's a book... Can I... This is, I don't know if y'all know uh, Jason Reynolds. Have you interviewed Jason Reynolds? No. Let me tell you what to do. Okay. You should do that. Jason, um, Jason Reynolds. Jason Reynolds, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and right now he's the national ambassador for young people's literature. And, but uh, I, I, there's a book of his called Look Both Ways. And I love to read author acknowledgments at the end. Mm -hmm. me and too. Uh, he, at the end of the book, uh, thanks everybody that he grew up with. Uh, and the candy store lady, because uh, a lot of this book takes place in a neighborhood. And then he says to the reader, I like you. I love you. Tell me, how are we going to change the world? And that's what a book does even, I mean, it's that, it's that connection. Even if you never meet Jason Reynolds, and even if you, but he, you can feel that. It's a palpable connection between reader and, and the person who's telling the story. And, and that can change lives. So you've had that experience also with a writer who means that much to you and really where you feel seen and reaches inside of you and changes you. How much... I don't do like the way you're arranging yourself. <laughs> it looks like it's going to be a real salvo there. So, okay. <laughs> we are not in a duel, Kate. We are... We are in a conversation, a friendly one. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was I saying? No. I win. Was, I what? win. No, no, no. I'm back on track. I'm back on track. I guess I'm curious about whether you feel compelled to share that experience with that writer. I, I, I have a, an ambivalence about that. Yeah, I, I, I totally, it? I get that. I, I remember um, when I was uh, working at the Bookman, um, which was an old book uh, distributor now out of business, and, um, and I was, I just, I worked in the warehouse where, you know, all the books were stored, and um, Richard Rousseau came. Oh, wow. And to sign, because a lot of times when people were on tour, they would come in and sign yeah. their stock there. And um, the book buyers said to me, oh, you can come, there's a, there's a cocktail uh, party that you can come to and, you know, talk to Richard Rousseau. And I had, you know, crept down and had him sign my book and then crept back up. And I, it was like, what would I say to him at a cocktail party? How could I ever m let him know how much, how, what could I say? And so I get, I get it. I do think that it might be, this is the thing that I feel about um, uh, the difference between uh, kids needing that and adults, because as an adult reader, it's like I get what I need from the book. And yeah. I know as a human being who's writing books, just how unspectacular, the, the best part of me are the books. You know, it's a lot better than, than me. But, but um, the, to have a kid come through a signing line. Yep. While it's a you're lot really taking than notes, me. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie says, I agree. Um, 
Not <laughs> but, at all. But the the there are always there's always a kid that had a, a, an experience with the book and to like, and, and just in the few minutes, sometimes it's just 30 seconds that I can let that kid know that I see them. It just, it matters so much in a way that I, I, I can't really describe to you. And, and that I believe in and, and, and I miss. So what do you think happens as we have that experience as kids, as readers, and everybody that's read, you know, as a young person understands that. What happens when that kind of drops away as a, as an adult? I, I think that um, we're more afraid of being seen as adults, and I think kids are more open to being seen. You're you're, you're just not as protected, um, and and also. It, it, it makes me think of something else that this is, I, w I know I was in Boston and um, uh, this kid stood up and I said, you put all these philosophical questions into these books for <laughs> kids and why you're writing for kids? And I said, because kids are the ones who are brave enough to ask those questions. The more you age, the more afraid you get. And the less questions you're, I mean, by the time you get to be my age, you're afraid to, to think about them. Kids are the ones that ask the big questions and want to think about them and talk about them. And by the time you're an adult, you don't want to look stupid, you know? Or face your cynicism. Right, or... yeah. I mean, do, do you all agree with that? Yeah, and, and so it's the kids are the brave ones, so. Okay, what did you mean when you said, uh -oh. I put the best of me, the books are the best of me? The, they are not only the best of me, but they're better than I am. Um, the, the story is... I've heard you do lots of interviews. I know you're not going to uh, <laughs> agree with this line of thinking, but I can only tell you that it's my experience. The story is smarter than I am. And so my job always is, because I know that you don't believe that I sit down and I don't know what's going to happen. No, I, it isn't that I don't believe that. I'm interested in that. Well, it's, it, 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 and everybody works differently. Yeah. Um, but for me, I, I don't know. And so when I sit down to write um, The Beatrice Prophecy, um, I have no idea. It's terrifying and it's exhilarating and I don't know where I'm going and that's part of why I also, and, and I can see things out of the corner of my eye that we would call themes after the fact. <laughs> um, and I think, don't look too closely at that. I, I don't, really? don't, yeah, just yeah. keep going. And, and, and it, so it's kind of like a subconscious thing. Mm -hmm. So have you learned over your writing career to be okay with the terror of not knowing where you're why going? Why is terror in quotes? I, that, 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 <laughs> why are you minimizing Ter my terror? Terror. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> Um, have I learned to be okay with that? Yeah, I've learned that that's um, that's the way that I work. I've I and and I've also learned to trust that part of me um, that uh, that is the best part of me, the part that knows what's going to happen. So it's the story, but it's also there's something in me that can go down into that darkness. I always think of it as like a long hallway and there's just a little line of light at the end of it. And that's wow. what, and then as I get closer and closer, it's just like, oh boy, I'm gonna be able to open up this door. And, and um, that door is filled with light and that's the, the end of the book. And I think, man, I'm never gonna do that again. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the last novel that I'll write, yeah. So, I mean, book number two, when you experience the long hallway and you're in the midst of the darkness, mm -hmm. you probably didn't have the confidence that you had in the hallway of the Beatrice prophecy, knowing that there would be light and you would figure out how to get to it. I, I still don't have that confidence. Really? But what I have is notebooks 
that I can go back and I can see that each time, each novel, it's the same thing. And so I, I have to think, okay, this, I found a way before, I'll, found, I'll find a way this time. That's, that's what I have. So you open notebooks that what were outlines of previous novels? Or Not what, outlines. What do they? Yeah, you're always trying to trip me ah. up. No outline. What, no. what were they? It's just the, the. It's just my journal of like as I'm working, and in the same phrase, uh, you know, the, the most optimistic phrase that I ever get to when I'm when I'm writing is this would be a good story if somebody else was telling it. That's the most upbeat I can get, um, and most of the time it's just like this is never going to work. I don't know what I'm doing. And then every once in a while, it's just like, oh, oh, okay, this is, this is a beautiful, I, I, sometimes it will feel like a ball of light. And then I think, okay. Where are those Newberry medals hanging? Oh, uh, they're not hanging. I, uh, it's, I've got an old, uh, I think of it as a desk that would have been an uh, Edward Hopper painting. Um, and it, it's, there are three drawers on the left and the middle drawer in the very back and sometimes on really dark days, I will open up that middle drawer and I'll look at the very back and then I'll slam it shut Okay, again. that's, yeah. that's yeah. yeah. That's what I wondered. Yeah. Because there They're, is... They rattle when I do that. Yeah, yeah. There's complete validation that you found your way and you will only on very dark days? Yeah, very infrequently do I do that because that's not my business. What you does know, that mean? I mean, my business is to do the work that I'm supposed to be doing now. And it's like, you know, I, <laughs> I've told the story a couple times recently. Um, I, I, it, my best friend that I grew up with, I was, th this is like, when, when Dixie came out, I think, and I was saying, oh, I can't believe all this because it was just like I didn't expect that many books to sell. And it was just overwhelming and I, I don't deserve it. And she said, you're right. You don't deserve it. <laughs> and then she said, I mean, she said this in a loving way. Right. It, it's not about you, pumpkin. And, and that's kind of like the Newberries are to look at that is like to, it's to make it about me. And it should be about the story. Does that make sense? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense to y'all. like, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I thought your friend was going to say something like, you're right, you don't deserve it, but own it, girl. <laughs> and and no, but it think was, of all the good you can do. And or. sometimes I'll just mutter to myself, it's not about you, pumpkin, you know? And then what do you I, say? And like coming out on a stage, that's a good thing to, to mutter to yourself, yeah. But it is about you here on the stage. Well, I'm trying to make it not be, but you keep on <laughs> shoving it me is. around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, would you feel better if we read an excerpt Sure. From the story, because it's about the story. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, so, um, Carrie, who's in charge here, has made the selections. And so, um, the book has only been out a few days, and so y'all won't know. You know that it's about a goat. Um, who um, a demon goat? A demon goat who uh, is in a monastery uh, with the Chronicles of Sorrowing, the brothers there. And th this goat terrorizes all the monks. And uh, there's one monk named uh, Brother Edik who uh, is an illuminator and uh, also happens to be in charge of feeding the demon goat. And he comes out one morning and uh, sees uh, that what at first he thinks it's uh, a two-headed goat and, and he thinks that that's the end of the world. You know, they... They can only, <laughs> like, with one head, she's already terrifying. So, uh, and then he realizes that. that there's a child uh, in with the goat. So, chapter three. A child next to the goat. A child curled up and holding on to the demon and Swelica. Brother Edict's heart thumped with dread. The goat's terrible teeth flashed through his mind. He knew these teeth more intimately than he would wish. On a summer day the year before, Brother Edick had spent what seemed an eternity being chased by Answelica through a flower-studded meadow. What the goat was doing in this meadow, miles from the monastery, close to the castle of the king, was a mystery that Brother Edick had never solved. 
brother Edict should not have been there himself. It was only that a traveler had told him of the flowers in the field, of their glory and profusion, and brother Edict thought that he must see this beauty for himself. In the meadow, the goat had come up behind him silently, stealthily. She breathed her terrible breath upon his backside. <laughs> then she gave him a gentle, almost playful butt with her head. Brother Edict began to run. He ran, and the goat followed him. The two of them ran together through the field of flowers, and when at last and inevitably Brother Edict tripped and fell, and Swalika came up to him and stood with one cloven hoof on his chest, looked deep into his eyes, and opened and closed her mouth. She drooled on him. <laughs> she gave him a good amount of time, another eternity, to consider her teeth in every particular, and to consider, too, the atrocities of which he knew them to be capable. Just when Brother Edict thought that he could bear it no more, the goat pressed her hoof down upon him very, very hard, then lifted it and walked away from him. He bore the mark of that afternoon still, the sullen, partial outline of a goat's hoof on his chest. The mark would stay there for the rest of his life, a red arrow pointing to his heart, as if anyone would need help locating Brother Edict's heart. Here, he said now, he took a step closer to the goat. We must be very careful. The goat ignored him. The small form nestled up against the goat did not stir. Brother Edict saw that the child's feet were bare and covered in blood. He shivered. Should he go and get help? You coward, he heard his father say. You broken-eyed coward. And it was true. He was a coward. But still, he could not walk away and leave this child alone with Answelica. He would have to confront the goat. You goat-fearing fool, he heard his father say. Brother Edict sighed. He wished his father's voice would leave him alone. He wished it could be silenced once and for all. Brother Edict gathered his robe and made to climb over the gate and into the goat's domain. And Swalika stood. She emitted a high-pitched noise. The child sat up, and Brother Edict saw long hair, astonished eyes, a face shaped like a heart, a girl child, she was crying. It was not outraged crying or sorrowful crying. It was the crying of someone who was tired beyond all reckoning. The crying of someone who was trying very hard not to cry. Tears rolled down her face as she looked into his eyes, both of them, his steady eye and his wild and wandering eye, and did not look away. Brother Edict looked back at her. He felt his heart shift inside of him. He felt it open. Oh, said Brother Edic. And Swalika let out another high-pitched noise. Shh, said Brother Edic to the goat and the girl. Shh, all will be well. All will be well. And yet, even as Brother Edic spoke those words, other words, more ominous words, were being spoken not far away. In the drafty throne room of the king's castle, a soldier bowed before the king and said, Sire, the woman is secured in the dungeon as you commanded. But I must tell you, the child is missing. I have searched all of Castle Abelard and its environs. I could not find her. What do you mean you could not find her, said the king? I mean, sire, that she is not there. Her body was not there. The girl is gone. Were you listening to that? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>
I'm Carrie Miller, and you're listening to Talking Volumes at the Fitzgerald Theater with author Kate DiCamillo. Her new book is titled The Beatrice Prophecy. You, you made such an interesting observation um, downstairs before we came out. You looked at the totality of the season, and you noticed that all of the authors are out with books about the past. The past, yeah. Including you. Mm -hmm. what, what, what occurs to you about why... Other than the obvious, we're in a pandemic and these are hard times. But yeah, and I wrote this way before the pandemic. It's just interesting to me. Yeah, um, I, and I don't, I mean, I wondered if y'all were aware when you... No. It's really no. interesting. So, it, because it's like Lauren's book is is 11th. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Amor's is uh, in the 1950s, 50s, right? Yeah. And William Kent Kruger's is the 1950s yes. as well, right? Yeah, and so and I'm somewhere. I mean, I, this is this book has been called medieval, um, and I'm not certain where oh. it, it really? is. Really? Yeah. How I mean, so? and well, there are a couple things, and I don't um, want to give spoilers away, but there are a couple things here and there that make you think. I wonder where we are, or I wonder where that came from. Um, there's a moment when, uh, so Beatrice is uh, a girl who can, the, the girl with the goat, uh, who can read and write. And it is uh, in this time and place, wherever it is and whenever it is, it's against the law for females to do mm -hmm. that. And, um, but she's been tutored. Um, uh, her father wanted her to be able to read and write. And so she, she, and he's dead, but he made certain that happened and her mother has honored that. Um, and the tutor has a book that he, he that the pages are very uniform. Mm -hmm. And the, the printing is very, it, it, there's just, it's like, it looks like it might be a book from now. A contemporary yeah, book? Yeah, right. And there's also a telescope in there. Um, That's and, right. Yeah. So there are these little things that make me, you know, is and there's a moment at the end of the book where it says, you know, all of this happened long ago, or maybe it has yet to happen. Yeah. But the monk is an illuminator. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You've made that purposefully ambiguous or uh it's purposely ambi it's unknown to me as well it could be that things have ended and begun again hmm. so you wrote this before the pandemic i did but you also um 
I think, started the book, was it in 2009? I started the book in 2009, and I see your reporter eyes looking at me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I started it, um, my mother passed away in 2009, and I started the book uh, a few months after she died. And um, I got uh, to the second draft, about 40 pages of the second draft, and then I put it aside. And um, I don't know why I put it aside, but I, I was then cleaning uh, my office closet, and this is also pre-pandemic, um, uh, in 2017. And it was one of those terrible, terrible closets that was filled with paper. You know how you have to go through each thing of paper? And at the very bottom uh, of the, the last pile was uh, the beginning of this book, 40 pages of it. And I sat and... Um, read it like I had had nothing to do with it at all. Wow. And so I could see that it kind of had legs, goat mm -hmm. legs, you know? <laughs> um, and, um, and, and, and it's funny because I had, to say that I had forgotten about it is really kind of uh, an understatement. There's a scene in here where Beatrice remembers a, the tutor holding uh, a seahorse out yeah. to her. And, and, the, and it kind of tumbles through her dreams. Um, and I, that would happen to me in the intervening years. I would think, where did I read about that seahorse falling? And I, and I, and I, I wrote about it. I just it made it up, I don't, but I didn't remember it. Which is so interesting to me because a seahorse, um, your hippo, Campus, mm -hmm. which is Latin for seahorse. The yeah. hippocampus is where you remember things. Yeah, so oh. kind of creepy, huh? Do you want to write that down? So yeah. <laughs> creepy. <laughs> so ha has that ever happened before where you've, as I'm thinking what you said about the passageway feels dark in the beginning and the middle. I mean, do you think this was an experience of, I just can't see that light at the end of this? Or was it something just much more I think it prosaic? was, you know, it, 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 I don't, I think it had to do with my mom passing away because I, I put that in there right about the time that I turned to a, a book about um, a squirrel getting sucked up into a vacuum cleaner and, and turning into a superhero who writes poetry. Um, as I always say to the kids, a true story. Um, and and I, 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 I think that I, I think that I wasn't ready. I, I, I was aware as I was working on the squirrel book that it would make my mother laugh. It mm -hmm. was a way of turning towards joy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I wasn't ready to deal with the, um, so much about this, this book is dedicated to my mother, right? Um, and uh, and only after the fact do I see probably why I put it away, and also what a lot of what it's about for me, which is um, my mother. Uh, I struggled to learn to read. Um, because I didn't understand phonics. I'm sorry for anybody who believes in phonics. It, it, it didn't work for me, and I'm not dissing phonics, so let's not get into it, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> I sense you've gotten into it before. <laughs> that's that's not people. the way my brain worked for whatever yeah. reason. And my mother was uh, uh, savvy enough to say, that's I mean, basically that's not the way your brain works. Great, okay, we'll just figure out a way around it, wow. right? And which was a super message, because she told me explicitly, "You're smart," and then she said, "We'll figure a way around this." And and she knew I was good at memorizing things, so she just made me flashcards with words on them, and I just memorized the words, and that's how I learned how to read. Wow. And. And That's I've had, pretty extraordinary. Well, it's extraordinary on my mother's part. Yeah. Yeah. That and and I. I wish that I had been fully aware of it. I've never forgotten it, but I wish that I'd been fully aware of it when she was alive, so I could thank her. I always knew that she took care of me as a reader. She got me books. She read to me. She knew what kind of books I would like. But I wish I could thank her for that because it was a multi-pronged thing that she gave me. And I was just one of those kids that knew what was in books was something that I needed. Uh -huh. I am, when people ask me who I am, the first word that comes to my mind is reader. Oh, 
that's man, who, that, that is okay. We got to applaud that. Yeah, that is yeah. so fantastic. But that's how I understand the world, and right. and and I just needed it so desperately, and I and uh, and I knew I needed it, and so in this book, there, th this whole world that doesn't want Beatrice to read, which is a world controlled by men, and then there's one um, person in particular, the counselor to the king, mm -hmm. who uh, really does not, is enraged by Beatrice's mind. He can see, because he, well, I don't want to give away too much, um, but he doesn't want her to be as smart and as headstrong as she is. He sees the power she'll yeah. possess, right? Right. And my mother made sure that I had that power. She saw who I was and she saw what I needed. And she helped me get there. Um, and so this book is for her, but for everybody who does that for somebody else, whether it's through words and stories or just somebody who sees you for who you are and what you need, you know. This is something um, Lauren Groff and I ended up talking about when she was here a couple weeks ago because she reads an unbelievable 300 books a year. Can you believe uh, that? I, <laughs> I, I, know, I, 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 feel, I feel competitive. <laughs> I, I feel... <laughs> I feel like, let me count how many I read. I, I don't was, know. Do you know how many you read a year? No, but I know it's not 300. When she said that, I just thought, I am a friggin' slouch. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is just, but it is completely her way of figuring out the world and what she thinks about. And I don't just mean the contemporary world, and you don't either. No, you're, my, my internal yes, world. Yes, exactly. But also there's that thing, and you know this, Carrie, because this is something that you've talked about, and all the, the science came out from right. behind it. It, it. It's not only that it teaches me about myself, it, that, that imagination lets me then think of what is somebody else's life like, right. and, the, and it builds empathy. And, um, and so it is how you understand yourself, how you understand the world, how you imagine and feel for the people of the world and the goats of the world and the squirrels of the world, right? Um, and it, that's the great gift of, of reading. And, and I am so aware, um, because I always, what I, 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 I work um, in the morning and then I deal with the, you know, the office work of, you know, answering emails and stuff. And then around two o'clock, I let myself sit down and read. That's and great. I think, well, this is part of my job. This is and the treat. It, yeah. And I can always feel it's like I enter my body. That is when I am utterly myself is when I'm, I'm reading. I feel centered, you know? You know, this reminds me, um, have you ever read any of Azar Nafisi's reading Lolita in Tehran? No, no. So what she talks about is how powerful and dangerous literature can be to a dictatorial state like Iran. She gathers these young women who have grown up in a pretty repressive society. I mean, this is true. This is not just a story, but it's a true story of her life. Gathers in her apartments, and week to week, they read these novels that you'd think, what does that have to do in any way? I mean, they read Gatsby. They read Daisy Miller. They just read these novels that you think, this would have no, nothing to say to these young women and that has everything to say, and the state is really threatened by the fact that she's doing this. Because I, once you can imagine your way into somebody else's life, um, then you think, what are we doing? You know, right. if everybody, it, it's like, if it, it, it's just, it makes you stop and, and think. Every face, I like to do this, well, I, I liked to do this, I, I don't do it anymore because I'm not in airports all the time, but like, just stand there with my luggage and watch every face go back. Like, really look at every face and think every, every person is carrying this story inside of them. Every one of them. And that's, like, to be able to do that, to look at um, each face that way, is, that's a gift of, of reading, right? Mm -hmm. Because I know for a fact that everybody carries this world inside of them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, well, you're giving me a very discerning look. I'm trying to think about how to ask this. So, oh, okay. Your mother, your mother must have been extremely proud that you not only were the kind of curious, brave reader you were, but then you took that and walked into this world of, worked your way into this world of, of writing. Did she... I don't know, understand how you chose the kind of writing that you do? What, what were your conversations like with her about the work you do? <laughs> well, the, <laughs> I can't, I, the fir very first time I did the, uh, the fits, um, I think my mom was here by then. I'd moved her from, she, when she was in the last five years of her life, she lived here. Um, and uh, friends brought her to the Fitz, and then um, afterwards they were driving her back and said, uh, what'd you think of that? And she <laughs> said, I've been to lots of shows before. It's just like I'm used to seeing people. She was always worried about me getting a big head. That was <laughs> <laughs> so she was like really, I, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. So she, it was this, it was, it was both things. It was just like because I remember, um, you know, when I started talking about wanting to be a writer, and um, she never said don't do that, um, and. Uh, that alone was a gift because a lot of people, uh, parents are like, it, it, it's terror in their hearts when somebody says, I'm going to go and be a writer. It's like, oh, don't you want to be a, a lawyer instead, <laughs> you know, so I don't have to worry about how you're going to pay the bills or that you might be living here for the rest of your <laughs> life, you know? All right. um, and, but she, it, and she got me, um, she got me one Christmas, the, the writer's market, which is where, you know, that came out every year about where to send. So, she, she did both things, you know? She was a conundrum in many, many ways, yeah. Huh. So it doesn't sound like there were many conversations That about is exactly <laughs> right. There were Here's you know? why I, you know, again, pick up the themes, you know, create these characters. Here's another story I remember. All right. Like when the last Harry Potter came out and I was picking my mother up for lunch and I, I and, and uh, she's standing out in front of her apartment building holding the clipping about um, how people all over the world <laughs> are stopping everything they're doing to read this book. <laughs> and she's holding that and she gets in the car and she's like, I don't know if you know this is going on or not. And I wonder, I wonder if you think that you're that big a deal now. Yeah. So there we <laughs> All right. She kept you in your place, yeah. kind of. And, and not at the same time. Right. Yeah, both things. Right. And, which was a way of letting me, you know, we had in the house that I grew up in, uh, it had a long, uh, uh, a long hallway. And, uh, and it was uncarpeted. And I would walk down that hallway. I, I tend to slam my heels when I walk. And my mother would say to my brother, here comes somebody who's intent on getting their own way. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I love, and did you say thank you? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so, I mean, she recognized. And, and you know what? If you're going <laughs> to. Part of, of being a. That, that served me well. Um, because. You know, I, that's another thing that when I would go out and talk to the kids as part of the PowerPoint, I would ask them to guess how many rejection letters I got. And um, they would start at five, and then somebody else would shout 10, and then some brave kid would go, ha, 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 50. And then I would say, I would put the number up, and it was 473 rejection letters is how many rejection letters I got. And they were dumbfounded by it. And that kid who was walking down the hallway slamming her heels, she came in and, and, and to good use. Um, because I just was, you know, I can't make myself talented, but I could make myself relentless, you know? Are you still somebody who is intent on getting her own way? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I, I think that, um, yes, I am. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, yes, yeah. 
Why are you saying that hesitantly? Isn't that a good thing? Well, I mean, I, I, I hope that I'm not, uh, I, I guess I'm very, it took me a long time to understand that I'm bossy and strong-willed. Yeah. Yeah, it took me a long time to, to come to terms with that. Which makes you wonderful. Oh, well, thank you, Carrie Miller. <laughs> I uh, think. <laughs> All right. Oh, boy, the therapy session continues, so yeah. <laughs> How about another excerpt? I'll okay. give you an out. Okay. I, I, I'm curious about um, why you chose what you chose. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> Let me open. Is, is that like, I don't know why we are reading this. Yeah, so I'm now, um, I'm going to okay. read chapter 31. Um, and, I, you know, I, you can address that question after I'm done reading, if you, but it will give you time to, to marshal an answer. So, um, so what happens is Beatrice is discovered um, and, uh, and taken into the monastery, the monks take her in, and then they realize that she can read and write. And they're like, oh, no, we've got to get rid of her because she's she's dangerous, somebody would be looking for a kid like this. So she is basically sent from the monastery along with the goat, which as far as the monks are concerned, kills two birds with one stone because they're terrified of the goat and the goat will not be separated from the girl so then they can get rid of both of them. And in, and in the course of her leaving, um, she becomes friends with a boy named Jack Dory who is an orphan boy who lives in the village. And she and Jack Dory then find their way into the dark woods and they encounter somebody who um, has a really good sense of humor. His name is Canuck. That's what I liked about it. Yeah, is that what you liked yeah. about it? Yeah. Okay, so this is when they find out who Canuck is. He lives in a tree, inside a tree, and he, he takes them into the tree. Canuck cleared his throat. He said, perhaps now's the time for me to speak of who I am. He looked at Jack Dory and then at Beatrice and then at the goat. He said, once I was king. Beatrice wiped the tears from her face. She looked up at Canuck. You were king, she said. This was long ago. I was king and then I was not. I walked away. How does a king walk away, asked Jack Dory. I said to the counselor and to the court, I will return momentarily. And I walked from the throne room. The crown was upon my head. I walked through the great hall and the servants bowed deeply. I walked out of the castle and to the drawbridge and the guard there saluted me. I walked across the drawbridge and heard my feet sounding against the wood of it and I liked the sound of my walking so much and I thought, I will keep walking. And you did, said Beatrice. I did, said Canuck. I kept walking. I walked into the forest, and the ground beneath my feet felt wondrous, better even than the wood of the drawbridge. I thought, I will keep walking. I walked unaccompanied. I walked without being accosted. I walked without anyone needing anything of me. It was glorious. The birds sang above me. The deer moved past me. I smelled bear and moss and wild honey, and I came to a body of water, a lake I had never seen, and I stood before it and thought of the last words spoken to me. They were from the counselor. His words were, we shall await your return, sire. I stood for a long time at the lake and considered those words, and then I took the crown from my head and threw it in the water and watched it disappear. I felt then as light as air. I had the thought that without the crown upon my head, I would not be able to keep my feet on the ground. The king who could not keep his feet upon the ground, said Beatrice, it sounds like a story someone would tell. Yes, yes, said Canuck, it sounds like a story, but it is the truth. I sat down on the ground and laughed and laughed, and oh, it felt wondrous to laugh. I could not remember the last time I had laughed. I took off my shoes and threw them in the lake along with the crown. And then I put my feet in the water and moved them about and laughed some more. And I thought, I will never return. I will laugh as often as possible. I will grow my beard. That will be my purpose on this earth, to laugh and to grow my beard and to never, ever return to being a king. Did they not come looking for you? asked Jack Dory. 
Come looking for me, said Kanak. He laughed. My child, please understand, no one comes looking for a king. For as soon as a king disappears, those who would replace him start to scheme and calculate about how to take the crown for themselves. Who knows how many kings there have been since I sat upon the throne? Who knows how many schemers and liars have worn a crown? No, no one searches for a missing king. There was a long silence, and then Kanak cleared his throat and said, that sword, he pointed at the sword leaning against Jack Dory's leg, that sword bears the mark of the king I once was and am no more. I suppose it has been handed down from a soldier father to a soldier son. Well, how do you think this is going so far? How do you think it's going? <laughs> great, great. Whenever we're laughing, it's going well. We've uh, laughed a lot. We have. It's been great. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions and answers, okay. or questions from the audience, questions answers from, from you, and answers from me. Okay. And but I'm going to say this: um, uh, Subtext Books is out in the lobby selling. Kate's books, and she has signed, normally we would have a signing up here, but because of COVID, she pre-signed. So it would be wonderful if you'd go out and buy a bunch of books. They make great gifts, Christmas gifts. Um, we're really grateful the subtext is here. Yeah, we hey, are grateful to subtext. question right over there. Woof to you, Miss Kate. I know. Pat Sharon. Uh, no. 
How are you? I'm good, thank you. Oh. I know how important your mom was to you, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if she comes out in any of your characters or all of them. Oh, she is so present in this book. There's um, a moment when, uh, when Beatrice remembers reading uh, from this storybook to her mother as her mother is uh, knitting or spinning. She's at a spinning wheel. And that is, again, this thing where I'm kind of like working by, I, I didn't realize it until after I was done, that I have this kind of flashbulb memory of uh, reading uh, this golden book of um, Pinocchio. It was lavishly oh. illustrated. It was huge, and it was unabridged. And I was reading it out loud to my mother, who was reading the newspaper in the Florida room, and kind of half listening to me and half not listening to me. But at one point, she stopped and said, that's good, Kate. You're, you're a good reader. And she was not somebody who gave idle compliments. And I knew, you know, it was one of those mo moments where I knew absolutely who I was. And so this mother in this book bears a lot of, is very related to my mother uh, in that way. Yeah. Other, oh, question right up there. Hi, I'm Julie. Julie, where are you? I'm right, right here. Right oh. over there. Oh, okay. I, I, I still can't see you. Oh, there you are. Hi, Julie. Okay. Hi. Yep. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I read The Tale of Despero, and it made me kind of think about, like, the characters and the theme put together. <laughs> like, what would it make? It, it, so the it, wait. So the character and the theme together. It made you think what? It made me think like, wow, what different kind of story would this make with the same characters? Like a book after it, like tells the story after it. Oh, wow. interesting. That's very very interesting. I, th I I wonder if you have any interest in being um, a, a writer yourself. <laughs> you do. Okay. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and I, you know, there's a line at the end of uh, Despero that says something about, but they, they go on to have many adventures together, but that happens in another book. And I think that you should probably write that book. Because this is the thing about stories is just like, and it, it's, I, you know, I talk about um, writing behind my own back and not knowing what I'm doing and the story being smarter than I am. And then once the story goes out into the world, it really is not about me at all and it becomes your story. So it's like then it, you and I are together in the story, you're reading it and you're inserting yourself in there, but then those characters are your characters. So I'll wait for you to write that book, okay? <laughs> She's like, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. I know uh, she can do it. Question right over there on that side. Yeah, I was leafing through the book and I noticed the wonderful illustrations too, so oh, I'm just wondering yes. how an author, how you work with an illustrator to come up with things that are appropriate for the book that yes. you have in mind. So and, and, glad and you I'm asked. Just, I'm so grateful that you brought up um, Sophie. Sophie Blackwell is the artist who did the illustrations here. I cannot imagine this book without them. And so the question is, how does that happen? How do we work together to make that, that happen? Uh, we don't. Um, and this is like something that uh, is very much, it, it, I've had my suspicions for a long time and I've had them confirmed that the publishers think that writers are crazy and artists are crazy and so it's not good for them to talk to each other because it's more <laughs> craziness, right? So we never do it together. Um, the thing though about Sophie doing this is that I had known Sophie um, to say hello to her at conferences here and there and um, and we had each other's email address. And so, so when the art comes through, it's the, uh, it's the art director who decides which uh, scene will be illustrated and how, kind of. And, and then I get to see the sketches. And, and the, this art that, as Sophie was doing it, we were in the pandemic. Mm. This art comes through, it's all black and white. 
It gives off, it's luminous. It is the most beautiful art. And it's also kind of that thing of what I saw as I was writing. And so I would cheat sometimes and write Sophie directly and say, I can't believe what you're doing here. And she said to me, um, it's like I'm drawing something that I remember. And I said, that's so strange, because that was kind of the feeling that I had as I was writing the book. So yeah, and this book, um, this is the great thing about doing books for kids, is you write a novel, and then somebody comes along and puts arts with, uh, arts with it, and, and, and it becomes, the, it's deeper, it's more mm -hmm. magical, mm -hmm. um, and it's more accessible, too. That's, it's just amazing what she's done. This wonderful sketch. Oh, isn't that something? It's beautiful. And if you're holding back. a book now, the, the, like the end papers that she designed with the seahorse in them, just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, her rendering of the goat is... Well, Spectacular. It is. Yeah. It's it's, Sophie had a goat when she was a girl. She, she did? didn't even really remember that until she was halfway through. She's <laughs> like, oh, I had a goat named Josephine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's kind of meant to be. <laughs> uh, question. I'm sorry. Hey, Tom, right over there. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, I was just wondering what's your favorite novel that you wrote? That I wrote? Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Um, are you here with a parent? That's my mom. That's your mom. And do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have three. Okay. Um, can, you, can you stand up, mother? <laughs> um, so which, which of the children do you like the best? <laughs> <laughs> Emma, uh, I think. That's a hard one, right? I always say <laughs> you're all my favorite. No, no, wait. I'll answer for you. You love them equally, equally. but differently, <laughs> right? Right. And, and the, the books feel like my kids to me. So I cannot pick a favorite. I see them all as uh, deeply flawed and lovable anyway, which I'm not implying anything about you, but it's just like, <laughs> I mean, I see them, I see them and, and where they fail and also where they succeed and I love them. And each book has given something different to me and opened the world up to me more differently. So I, I can never pick a favorite. It's really nice to see kids here. Emma, I'm glad you yeah. came. We didn't Thank know you. whether we would get kids here because yeah. of the obvious, but it's yeah. really nice that you came. Uh, there was a question, right? Wait a minute. You know, you thought Emma was going to ask your favorite novel overall, right? Yeah, but I can't answer that either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, I'll get back to you on that right there. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, yeah. You talked about journaling. Yeah. As you write, those two parallel processes, is it you're writing about what you write? Uh, I'm, no, I, typically this is how it goes, is that um, I get up really early and um, while well, it's still dark, and I go down and I write my two pages, that's what I have to do, um, uh, and before I can talk myself out of doing it. And then I go back up and I get into uh, bed with a cup of coffee and the notebook. And so then I, I might write about what I just wrote downstairs, I generally, there's some kind of note about it, like, boy, this is never going to work. Or sometimes it's just like it's opened up and I didn't expect it to, or this character showed up. But it's also just me writing about myself, and the writing goes in there. And there are sometimes in the, uh, in the time in between uh, finishing the writing, pouring the second cup of coffee, going back up the stairs, something will click and I'll understand something about what just happened downstairs, and then that will go into the notebook. So it, 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 it's, it's kind of like when you're in the shower and you suddenly understand something, mm -hmm. when your mind turns away from it, and then it, it, I'll capture it in the notebook. Uh, we'll get the microphone down here. Uh, right over there. Hi. Um, Hi. So I was just wondering, I mean, especially, uh, I've noticed in a lot of your books, but especially with Beatrice fresh on my, fresh on my mind. Did um, you read it already? Yes, twice. Oh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, you know, thank you. Thank it you. It was um, incredible. Um, but there's this, uh, I guess, I don't want to say theme. There's <laughs> <laughs> several instances of this incredible symmetry and mirroring and reflection of the main story. 
uh, in objects that the characters have. I think in example of Beatrice is the mermaid brush, but I think there's a lot of it in all your stories. And I was just wondering, because you said that you don't plan them before, uh, I was wondering how that how that be. happens. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, I wonder it too. Um, and 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 you know, so the the way I work is I do a draft of, uh, that um, looks like uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining wrote it. So, I mean, it's crazy. I just do a really really rough draft. And then I come back and I do a second draft, um, and it looks a slightly less crazy. Third draft. And then by the time I get to the fourth draft, those things that you're talking about, and I think that you have a good mind to be a literary critic, those, those, those things, the, the, the brush, the mermaid brush, the seahorse, I start to be aware of them out of the corner of my eye. And so I let them come into my consciousness more, and I see if I can, like, kind of, it's kind of like connecting the dots, but I'm doing it without looking directly at it. Does that make sense? So much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, thank you for reading it. And thank you, thank you for reading it twice. It just, it, <laughs> it, it, it thrills me. I cannot tell a lie. It thrills me. And I'm so grateful. So thank you. Question right over there. And then we'll, then we'll bring a microphone right down here. Tom, to the front row, if you would. Okay. okay. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. Yeah, I'm a little loud there. Um, <laughs> did you choose, or does it just happen? Did you write for middle school? I guess you would call sure, it. Sure. Yeah, middle school. grade. Yeah. yeah. Did I? I did not choose. Can and chose, should I tell you how I arrived here? Um, so I, uh, I'm going to tell it really quickly. Um, I I uh, majored in English in college, um, and. Uh, I had no idea what I was going to do with an English degree. And um, the adults would say, what are you going to do with an English degree? And I would, <sighs> I don't, don't talk to me. I don't need to answer that question. And then uh, in my senior year, I had a professor who um, told me that I had a certain facility with words um, and that I should consider graduate school. And because I was 20, 21, I thought, this guy's trying to tell me I'm super talented. Um, and um, <laughs> therefore, I'm going to go and be a writer. Um, and so I got a black turtleneck, and um, <laughs> no lie, and I uh, went off to be a writer. I thought, why bother with graduate school if I'm so talented, right? <laughs> um, and, and then I spent the, the next 10 years of my life um, telling everybody that I was a writer and not writing. And so I finally, right before I turned 30 and right before I moved here to Minneapolis, I started to write two pages a day and I started to write short stories for adults, thinking they're short, therefore they're easier. Not no. the case at all. And I started to send those stories out to literary magazines. Um, uh, and I started to collect my rejection letters. And when I moved here, I got a job in the Bookman, which we talked about before, the book warehouse. I was assigned to the third floor. The third floor was all children's books. And I'm a reader. And I entered, and my job was a picker. I went around filling the orders, picking the books off the shelf. And so it was just a matter of time before I started to read what I was picking. And I, I, the first novel that I read that would, had been written for kids since I was a kid was, and I had, it was The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, by Christopher Paul Curtis. Raise your hand if you know it. It's fantastic. It's funny. You don't know it. I do know it. Do you? Yeah. Okay. It's been mentioned actually by other authors it's, as it's, influential. It's, it's funny. It's warm, and it deals with huge things. And I thought I want to try to do something like this. So I took the book home. I typed up a chapter, and um, it's like, okay, that's how long a chapter is. And then pretty soon after that, I started on because of Win Dixie, and I remember thinking as I was working on Win Dixie, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and. Um, and it is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I'm so grateful to be doing it. But I got there by happenstance, you know? Did you also get to the Twin Cities because a friend, a good friend, oh, was yeah, here? Yeah, good friend. Lisa Beck, where are you? Is Lisa here? Oh, there she is. Yeah, a U-Haul. Yeah, and, and Lisa Beck. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We were talking about friends. Yeah. If yeah. not for Lee. Okay, yeah. wait a minute. And I moved here without, like, I, I knew Lisa Beck. I knew nobody else. And I thought... <laughs> Pat Sharon, you've heard this. How cold can it get? I mean, 
I just thought, how yeah. cold can it we be? We all ask that. Yeah, you come it's just from like it can't else. be that bad. And I didn't have socks. I didn't. I just like it's like it can't be that bad. Yeah. If not for Lisa, mm -hmm. if not for Bookman's, right. If not for the third floor. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. No. It's 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 unbelievable to do that. To me, it's unbelievable to do that because it all is just. It seems like happenstance, but it's that story that Isaac Dennison tells about like this uh, the man who like gets out uh, uh, in the middle of the night and hears a noise and he he can't figure out where it's coming from and he goes all over in the mud of his farmyard and he wa he wakes up in the morning and he sees that all of his wanderings have made this pattern they've made the pattern of a stork and that's the way it feels to me like it was all happenstance. But yet here I am doing exactly what I feel like. You know, every once in a while, uh, somebody will say to me, when are you going to write a real book, like, i.e., an adult book? And it's just like these, this, I am doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world to get to do it, you know? Who has the intestinal fortitude to say to you, when are you going to write a real book? <laughs> I mean, well, I'm 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 small, so you've, you've, you know people. They misunderstand. Yeah, my mother always said that it's great that I was small; otherwise, I would get beat up for my mouth. They so, don't yeah, know. Yeah. yeah. They don't know you are a, a girl and a woman who gets what she wants. Yeah, someone right? who intends to get their own way. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I have to say, holy begumba. <laughs> and how did Flora and Ulysses come to be a movie? My granddaughter and I watch it many times. It's so funny, isn't it? It's so funny. Um, it, 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 so Disney um, made Flora and Ulysses into a, a movie, and they did a spectacular job. And um, I got to go to the set and do the little, I, I appear in a cameo at the end. And every time I go to a movie set, I think, oh boy, I can't wait to go back to writing books again. <laughs> because it's just like, they work so hard. It's just like, to, for me to be in that one little, I'm there for a nanosecond, it was just like we did like 20 takes of that, you know? Um, so, but it's magical because, um, you know, people say, oh, how can you let your story go? Because it's always different when it's a movie. But it's like the story, it goes back to the story being like my a kid of mine. I want it to go out into the world, right? I want it. And, and who am I to say that it can't be retold again and again and again? And you laughed in that movie, didn't you? Holy begumba. Yeah, it is so funny. Let's, let's, we should talk about the cat and that. No, we won't. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Question up there in the box. Hi, so I was wondering, all the characters that you write about, were you ever in a situation where you had a problem and you thought that you maybe couldn't solve it without one of those characters? Mm. Like they gave you the answer? That's a brilliant question. <laughs> that, that is a really brilliant question. And, and, and I'll answer you in a non-specific way in that so much of what goes on for me when I'm writing a story and that thing of like not knowing what's going to happen and watch and, and, and following the characters through it is I get to, uh, because while I've never put myself in a book, at the same time, myself is in each one of those characters. So I get to learn how to be brave by watching those characters. I get to learn how to... Uh, laugh at myself by being with those characters. And so each character teaches me something about myself and how to be in the world. Does that make sense? And so it, that is one of the great gifts of writing is that um, it, it helps, it's, it's the same as reading for me and that it helps me understand myself better and the world better. It's a brilliant question, thank you. Is tomorrow a school day? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It just it but actually really just occurred to me. Here. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's take two more questions. So we can go buy some books and the kids can get get home and get to bed. Right over there. Yeah. I don't really know how I'm gonna follow these kids' questions. <laughs> yeah. But, right. Um, <laughs> I so I also struggled learning how to read. It took me until like fourth grade before I could actually like sit down and read a book, and my mom is actually sitting here right now, and she was also an inspiration for me. Um, and I still 
find that I struggle, and maybe this is a question for both of you, but I still find like reading is very intimidating to me. And like if I get invited to do a book club or whatever, then I'm like, nope, because I just don't read fast enough. And I was wondering if either of you have any ways of kind of overcoming that and how to how to just push yourself to, you know, make that time to read and to continue because there are there's such so many worlds out there that you can discover by reading. It, for me, uh, and I, I wonder what your answer is going to be. But for me, I um, it, it's it, it's goes to what I said when I was national ambassador. I said this a lot um, that uh, and this is encouraging kids to read. It's just like we forget um, what a privilege it is to be able to do it and uh, what a joy it is. And so it's so often presented to kids as uh, something that you have to do. And, and I, so I would not present it you know, to yourself that way. This is like, imagine that you get to have this privilege of holding this book and escaping into this world, and it's a joy. And so for me, it's always that thing that I look forward to. Two o'clock, oh boy, I can read, you know? And so I would think it, it's like, and the book will wait for you. It's not judging you. <laughs> um, it's, it's not saying hurry up. You don't have to answer any questions at the end. Um, it is just for you to be in. You know, I, I, because I was a kid who loved to read, and I would read a great story, and I would get to the end, and there would be 20 questions, and I would feel my heart go all the way down to my toes. It's just like, I don't want to. I don't want to answer all those questions. I want to be in the story. Let yourself be in the story. What's your, what's your answer? Um, I wonder if you've tried audiobooks. Oh, because that's, that's good. Because it's a... I just listened to Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet, and oh, I listened to it. Oh, that's such a good book. It. Have you listened to it, or did you read it? I read it. Okay. So it's a way to tumble into the story, listening. And don't let anybody tell you that listening to an audiobook is any less meaningful than reading. Absolutely. But it will give you, I think, some experience to kind of tumble into the story and lose yourself in it while you're doing other things. I mean, I'm driving and everything, listening to Hamnet and just marveling at the language, at the just incredible poetry of the way she writes. Then I think you get a little bit, well, let me try this on for size with, you know, a, a, a hardcover book or a paperback. But I find, I just listened to Amor Toll's Rules of Civility and I listened to it again and it was just, I listened while I was hiking. One of my favorite reading experiences mm -hmm. to be nice. somewhere out in, nature and moving and having my mind engaged with this wonderful idea that the writer has, has brought. So I'd, I'd say experiment with that. That's a good piece of advice. Thank you. Yeah. One last question for Kate, even though I know, oh, yes, up there, hi. People, there's Hello. even some people that sat way oh, up my on the goodness. top there. Wow. Hello. Hello. First, I want to give a shout out to this gentleman over here for flagging you down to come up here. <laughs> um, so I am a currently an infant teacher, but I spent seven years working as a preschool teacher, and I found your Mercy Watson books. Oh. <laughs> um, I, they're great books. Um, technically, I have two questions, but I'll stick to one. Um, <laughs> So I am a person who does voices, ah. especially when I'm reading to children. So when you were writing the Mercy Watson books, <laughs> did you have a voice to the character like whose lines you were writing? Sure. Uh, well, um, I, I can hear it and I can see it as I as I write, and I can and I also read out loud as I write. Um, and uh, I bet you you do a great baby Lincoln. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yes. Yes. And uh, Eugenia Lincoln um, sounds a little bit more like Catherine Hepburn, I think. Um, and and she's <laughs> perpetual. You know, it's so funny because Eugenia Lincoln is really always perpetually in a bad mood. And kids 
love Eugenia Lincoln. They're, they're, like, they're like, what is she so upset about, you know? Um, and yes, so I hear the voices and I see them too. So it's an auditory and a visual experience for me as I, as I write. And um, I, I, I would like to hear your baby Lincoln someday, which sounds problematic. I mean, can we put that on the radio? <laughs> Never mind. Don't, yeah. <laughs> Don't, yeah. Yeah. But, right. and, and can I say, because this is one of my favorite things to say, and, I, and, and there you are, and I get to say it. I was a kid who grew up in a house filled with books with a mother who read to me and took me to the library, and Mrs. Boyette reading Island of the Blue Dolphins every day after lunch. I feel like it saved my life, and I think, what about the kids who aren't getting it anyplace else? And so for you people, for you teachers and librarians and parents, anybody who you read aloud to somebody, you are, and also just what you said about audiobooks, you know? We are story animals. We need it desperately. So thank you for what you do. And, and particularly, I, I know there's so many uh, teachers tell me that there's not time in the day to do it, but they would never give up doing it. And it matters. It matters so much. And so thank you. And there, that's, yeah, yeah. Hey, this, I mean, this has just been the best. It, Thank is, you yeah. so much. It's so wonderful to have you. I don't know why it took you so long to come to the stage of well, the Fitzgerald Theater. Well, I don't Theater. know. You have to invite me. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all for yeah, coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Now go buy some books. And thank you. Thank you, Kate.